Thank you. Uh, may I just say first that uh, in case you're wondering that I'm not freely walking around on the stage here, then it's because the microphone system doesn't match the clothes that I'm wearing today. So uh, I'm stuck behind the podium here, so now we know. Yeah, this is the first slide and you cannot leave a place until you have arrived. Kind of makes sense to say that, but there is a deeper meaning to it and I'll get back to that later. The topic of my presentation today is a brand new one and from what I understand, many aviation people are puzzled about how to present this, in particular in classroom training. I gave it a lot of thought and tried out my theories, so what I'd like to present to you today is how I see we as trainers can approach the topic not only from a classroom training perspective, but also from a simulator training perspective. I'm not getting into details about the bodily reactions and the meaning of the startle response, as I'm sure you've done your homework and you know all about it. I'd like to start at a completely different place. Meditation. The meditation and the brain research has been rolling in steadily for a number of years now, with new studies coming out just about every week, illustrating some new benefits of meditation or rather, some ancient benefits, which are currently being confirmed with MRI scans or EEG. The practice of meditation appears to have an amazing variety of neurological benefits, from changes in gray matter volume, to reduced activity in the me centers of the brain, to enhanced connectivity between brain regions, and many more benefits. The neuroscientist Sarah Lazar and her team at Harvard found amaze, via amazing brain scans that eight weeks of mindfulness meditation can actually change the size of key regions of our brain, improving our memory, making us more empathetic, compassionate, and resilient under stress. Just a few days of training improves concentration and attention. So I thought I'd start out with a short video just to take in, you into a relaxed mood. So just sit back, relax and enjoy. I'm sorry if I startled you a bit here. The startle uh, that some of you felt, which I could see from up here, uh, was created by a sudden surprising event, mostly related to oral but also visual stimuli. And it is triggered in as little as 14 milliseconds. Apart from raising our heart rhythm, it opens our eyes up wide, connects our muscles, preparing them to run or fight. The problem here is that momentarily it completely overrides our ability to think or use procedure. So let's show the exact same video clip again. And this time it will be the exact same one. This time please pay attention to your bodily reactions. really cool, <laughs> can't say, but that was definitely different from the first time. I hope you could feel it yourself, uh, just by being prefer pre prepared that you have a different reaction pattern to the second time I showed you this video clip. I, at least I, from up here, could see that there was a difference from the first time I showed you the video clip. So we could argue that what we've done between the first time I showed the video to the second time is resilience development. I'm going to leave meditation for a while and follow up on resilience development. It seems that having experienced the scenario with the ghost jumping in on the screen once made you more resilient to the second time you came across the same scenario. And so it would seem 
that we've done resilience training. But I am I'm wondering, did I make you more resilient to having a startled response? Or did I simply make you more resilient to this particular scenario? And I claim the latter. We only trained resilience to this particular scenario. This is the core of my presentation today. The e uh, and it's all right, it's supposed to be like that. The easy way to deal with startle effect and resilience development is to create a startling scenario whether it be in the simulator or in a mock-up or even in the classroom, then watch the pilot's behavior, and if it isn't satisfactory, then we do it again. And when we see the satisfactory behavior, then we can tick mark that. Startle response training done, check. Resilience development training done, check. But again, I claim that all we've done is training resilience to the particular scenario. And what we ought to do is trained resilience to the startled response. Well, next question is obvious. Is it at all possible to train the brain's response to a startling event? And how do we do it? If doing startled response training in the simulator with a satisfactory outcome is equivalent to training achieved, then we are forgetting the environment, that the environment in which the pilot is doing training is not the pilot's everyday working environment. A pilot's everyday working environment can, from time to time, require full concentration, and at other times, it hardly requires thinking. Sorry. Let's have a look at um, different levels of situational awareness. From an article in Stratfor, I found some explanations of different levels of situational awareness, and I'll use these explanations to build upon in the following to help paint the picture. I'm referring to five levels of situational awareness. They are tuned out, relaxed awareness, focused awareness, high alert, and comatose. Now, the tuned out uh, awareness level, I think you can all relate to this situation. The deserted highway with no other traffic, nice weather, hours of driving behind you, and hours of driving ahead of you. We might have the radio turned on at full blast, and thoughts may start to wander. Relaxed awareness. This traffic situation requires that we step up our awareness a bit. Although the situation requires us to step up and pay more attention, we can still continue having a conversation or even sing along to our favorite tune on the radio. Now, focused awareness. In this situation, we need to stay focused. This is a situation in which we might need to keep conversations to a minimum and maybe even turn the radio down so that the music doesn't distract us. Uh, the last, um, or the second last one, the high alert, is illustrated by a very short video clip. It's coming here. Only 20 past square right. Five left here, only 20 down to a fast on square right. Fuck, five left, 60 after, stay in the middle of a press jump, flat over the finish. Flat, 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 good man. <laughs> Mr. Kelly. Uh, well, it's almost self explanatory. It isn't the time for thoughts to wander, nor the time for chit chat, and although the car radios are still playing, playing loudly, we do not sense the music. The following example helps define comatose. The saber-toothed tiger that illustrates the state of fight, flight, or freeze. The human brain will focus on the threat to the exclusion of all other issues, meaning that we lose access to our rational mind. And research shows that it's very difficult to change mental states quickly, especially when the adjustment requires moving several steps, say from tuned out to high alert. The focused awareness will be a good starting point for dealing with a critical situation. But we must be aware that there is a limit to how long humans can perform effectively 
if remaining at the focused awareness level for hours. You can easily imagine how driving on the icy road for hours would drain your energy. Being at the tuned out level is almost directly dangerous as it, as mentioned before, is very difficult to change mental states quickly. At the high alert stage, adrenaline levels are already high and one can easily imagine how just a little more can take us into comatose. This means that the optimum level to be at when a critical situation arises is the relaxed awareness. On the next slide, I've combined the levels of situational awareness with the Yerkes and Dotson stress curve, and the result is this. I've asked pilots to relate these five levels of situational awareness to phases of flight, and what they always come up with is this. Pilots recognize the tuned out feeling as similar to crews on longer flights or night flights. They recognize the tuned, uh, uh, sorry, they recognize the relaxed awareness as similar to taxiing in in good weather conditions in a familiar airport or climb out after 10,000 feet or the initial part of a descent. Focused awareness seems to relate to takeoff and landings, to bad weather conditions, taxiing out in bad weather or in difficult airports. The high alert is perceived to be similar to in-flight non-normal situations or taking off or landing in difficult airports. The comatose isn't linked to any particular phase of flight as it can arise at any time and it can be induced by a demanding technical failure or simply pilot-induced. However, the feelings that arise when in comatose are recognized by all pilots. Based on what I've presented so far, I see two, well, at least, problem areas. Problem number one, the fact that when pilots show up for their half yearly simulator check, their level of situational awareness is already up at, at least, the relaxed awareness, and when performing their duties in the simulator, they are probably at the focused awareness level, so that when they encounter the startling problem thrown in by the simulator trainer, they are all well prepared mentally to deal with it. But in reality, in real life flights, pilots are often at the tuned out level, thus increasing the risk of being unable to raise the awareness level to the required, to the required steps. And problem number two, I think I can best describe that and illustrate that with a painting of a beautiful lady. As you observe, I'm going to show you the, the uh, painting of the lady in a moment, and, and as you observe the painting and all its details, the hair, the jewelry, the clothing, the colors, and so on, think of when you believe this lady was portrayed. Was it in 1900, 1910, or 1920? Again, I apologize, of course, if I startled you. Um, but, you know, I thought we'd already trained resilience to the unexpected when I showed you the first clip of the car and the ghost. And this is problem number two. In order to train a pilot to have a correct reaction pattern in a startling situation, it requires that the situation has been trained many times before the brain can recognize that particular situation and then react correctly the next time the brain encounters this situation. And there are countless situations that can create a startling response in a pilot. Situations that we don't even have the imagination to dream up, especially because the startling situation may be pilot-induced. Pilots can easily describe how it feels to be startled and they recognize their reaction pattern upon a startle to be target fixated or having tunnel vision, basically in a fight, flight or freeze mode. Luckily, in most cases, pilots regain their rational thinking and instead of continuing downwards to even more comatose, they climb back up again and into the optimum area. Unfortunately, unfortunately 
And this is why we are now encouraged to include the topic startle effect and resilience development in training. It sometimes happens that pilots do not regain their rational thinking and take themselves into a sort of spiral, only worsening the situation. Right after the startle, it's like there is a short moment in which the brain can go either back into optimum or continue into comatose. I refer to this moment as the window of opportunity. It is this window that we need to define and catch and thereafter train the correct reaction pattern. And in order to define the window, each individual pilot must know thoroughly how thoroughly know his or, her, his or her feelings, his or her reaction patterns before, during and after the window of opportunity. How else will he be able to, able to react upon them or even train himself to a different reaction pattern? In the world of emotion-focused psychotherapy, any psychotherapist will know the expression you cannot leave a place until you have arrived. And if we take that expression into pilot training, it means that a pilot will have uh, to know how it feels, or rather he has to know how he feels to be there in the window before he can actually leave the place. In order to develop resilience to a startle response, the trainer must be able to spot when the pilot or trainee is getting close to the little window of opportunity. At that exact moment, pilots must be trained to handle their startle response. So what are the tools to handle a startle response? It is often said that pilots should sit on their hands. Well, I have never seen a pilot literally sit on his hands whilst pondering over his next move. So it seems reasonable to determine what actually could be meant by this expression. And here's a couple of ideas. Control your breathing whilst actively thinking of controlling it. Control your pace of speech whilst actively thinking of controlling it. And control your body movements whilst actually thinking of controlling it. Breathing, moving, and speaking, or at least uttering sounds, are all things that are taken care of subconsciously in the lower parts of the brain, the reptilian brain, even if we're in a comatose state. So when I say control your breathing, your speech, and your movements whilst actively thinking of it, it's because this is a way of actively taking control of your brain again. In other words, a way of opening the pathway to the rational brain by actively controlling some rather simple things. And once the pathway to the rational brain is free, we'll have access to the creative thinking and to more complicated task solving than simply to breathe or move. Now, I'm not saying sit still and control your breathing for two long minutes. I'm just saying take control of one breath in and more importantly, control one exhalation. One exhalation is a tiny little moment, moment of meditation. And this is enough to engage the rational brain again, and it is good use of the window of opportunity. Now I'd like to sum up my thoughts on how resilience to a startle response can be trained. Meditation is a preventive measure against having a negative startle response. I know I'm being a bit controversial when I suggest that pilots should do meditation on a regular basis. But given the magnificent benefits, they really ought to. Robert W. Coleman Elementary School in the United States has replaced detention with the mindful moment room, where unruly students go to meditate or practice breathing exercises before returning to class. And the results are stunning. So stunning that the project is also being implemented in other schools. Paul Ekman, a pioneer in the study in emotions and their relation to facial expressions, tested the startle of a Tibetan monk. The test sound used was loud, just below the threshold for human tolerance. 
Police personnel who fired guns routinely were unable to prevent themselves from flinching when the sound was triggered. Yet, when the startled reflex was tested for the facial expressions of the monk, not a muscle on the man's face had flinched. This indicates that startle can be inhibited via training, even though it is triggered by activity in the brain stem. Another preventive measure is to have an awareness of levels of situational awareness and the impact on subsequent behaviours. This may mean, for instance, the implementation of procedures that help pilots lift themselves to at least a relaxed awareness level in order to be ready for the unexpected. Strong emotions will cause us to breathe quicker, speak quicker, move quicker, tighten our muscles. And all of these components all react and reinforce one another to optimum functioning. By, for instance, asking the crew member to adjust one of these com components, for example, breathing, slower speech and movement will follow and slow down with it. This leads me to two important points increased awareness of own reaction patterns and recognition of the window of opportunity will help re-engage the rational part of the brain. And finally, there is one extra element that I feel the need to include, and that's the pilot monitoring. We mustn't forget that it takes two pilots to allow an accident to happen it is unlikely that both pilots will experience a startle response in the exact same millisecond and have the exact same reaction pattern to it. So a powerful tool to help the startle pilot who is flying the aircraft is for the pilot monitoring to intervene. This can, for instance, be done via questions that engages the rational brain because it requires thinking, such as, what is going on? What do you see? What is the problem? And this concludes my presentation for today. I'm thanking you for listening and please give it a thought. <laughs>